It's that time again. We're talking Detroit Lions football on the Our Lads Football Network for the Our Lads Football YouTube channel. And when we're talking Detroit Lions football, you know it's time to talk with Jeff Risden. How's it going, Jeff? That's it. You there? Can you hear me okay? All right. My, uh, oh, did it go out? I'm going to use my we're connection. Live. You're really blowing it now, man. You can't hear me, I guess. Anyway, as Jeff figures this out, just want to remind everybody to subscribe to the channel, like and share. Uh, that's all the cool stuff. Jeff's been our Detroit Lions analyst for several years now. A lot of bad times, but the good times are obviously uh, already underway. Uh, and that's why this is a really good offseason to find out how Detroit's going to take that next step. Uh, matter of fact, behind me, you can see, uh, is uh, the Detroit Lions podcast on YouTube that's running. Uh, Jeff does that uh, uh, several times, actually three times a week. Jeff's on there. Uh, you can check him out at uh, the lionswire.com. As you can see there, draft wire. Uh, Jeff, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I'm, I'm, my, my internet's being a little spotty right now, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get through this okay. That's okay. I was telling you just before, I was I was a couple minutes late because I, I plugged in my, my usual uh, mics and everything. And I was like, why, why isn't my audio working? I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. This is, I haven't had this happen to me in weeks what's going on here and then sure all i had to do was just take it back out put it back in and it worked so uh we'll get through that's, it. yeah that's usually the first thing you should probably try i guess uh, <laughs> before going through all the other stuff all right anyway uh let's talk detroit lions football and we're going to talk yeah. about the nfl draft and uh the first big draft following uh or i should say the first draft following the first big season uh for yeah. detroit and in a long time and so this is the draft that was very important because there were still some holes uh, that needed to be filled up. Uh, and hopefully between the offseason, um, including the draft, they were able to accomplish that. Uh, did you give a grade to the Lions draft, Jeff? Yeah. Um, and, you know, we had, you know, obviously the acquisition of Carlton Davis via trade um, soaked up one of the third round picks. So that was that was the primary um, big one. But then signing DJ Reader to fill the defensive tackle um, that sort of filled the two biggest needs on the team before the draft. And that's, it's kind of what you want to do. You know, if, if, if you have the immediate holes and you can get guys that can fill them, the Lions went out and, and filled that. So that was, uh, that was important. And that, that set them up for the draft that they had, which was, uh, you know, so far so good. Um, yeah. I'm happy with it. I like it. <laughs> yeah. I gave them a B. So I thought, uh, again, not a lot of picks, uh, but uh, I, I felt they yeah. were definitely above average, which a B is. And uh, the main position that we're going to go over, obviously, this offseason is cornerback. So yeah. um, let's go ahead and do that. By the way, what we're going to do two later on, uh, before I wrap up, we're going to talk a little bit about the schedule. So anybody that wants to find out uh, a little bit more, uh, and I'm sure you guys uh, did your own uh, schedule video, but we're going to do a couple minutes on that. And sure. uh, besides the draft picks, we're going to talk about any of the uh, players that were signed after the draft that you believe could make an impact. Cause it's always a player that is signed after the draft that ends up making the team or uh, got, a, the, got a couple happens every year in Detroit. <laughs> well, and you hope maybe one of these days, uh, well, you, you always want that to happen. That's a, that's a sign of a really good scouting staff. No question about it, but I'm sure yeah. it's going to be a lot harder in years to come to make the roster uh, as the roster gets uh, as deep as it has been. Uh, and that's how uh, you're, you're, you're successful during the season. So let's go ahead and kick things off with right. um, the two cornerbacks. So again, yeah. the Carlton Davis move uh, before the draft, and then they add Terry and Arnold and Rackestraw, Enos Rackestraw uh, in uh, the first couple of rounds. Matter of fact, get, being able to get Arnold with the, what, 24th overall 20th. pick. Yeah. Was it 24? So what 24th overall pick. That considering this is our lad's top rated corner, and to be able to get yeah. that, uh, the Lions staff must have been uh, ec ecstatic. And one, a couple of things that I noticed, by the way, between Arnold and Rex. So, when I take a look at the scouting report here at our lads, this is the draft guide, of course, you can still purchase at ourlads.com, has all the scouting reports, except the kid from BC, Canada. But I mean, come on, who has scouting <laughs> report on that guy? So, nobody. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, when I look at the scouting reports, I see very sim similar uh, keywords. I see aggressive. I see can make big hits. 
and I see ascending talent, which is probably the biggest one most of all for both of them. Absolutely, and that certainly fits Arnold. And yes, it was a big surprise that they were able to trade up even to, to, to get him at where they did. Uh, picking 29th, we we knew, like we collectively, we all knew the Lions really liked him and saw oh, this is exactly the kind of guy that they want, but we're like, are they going to be able to, uh, will they have the firepower to trade up to 14 just as an arbitrary number to, to get him? Oh, yeah. I'm like, I, I don't think they're going to do that. And then, the you know, with, with was it the first 13, 14 picks were all offense. We're like, oh, okay, may, maybe this is going to get a little bit easier. Um, it was, you know, we also knew that they also, uh, Quinion Mitchell, tremendous amount of appeal for what the Lions wanted as well. Um, and uh, so, so for me, I had them ranked literally right next to each other. Um, I, I believe they were number 10 and number 11 overall for me okay. um, in my overall ranking. So I'm like, okay, well, e- either one, I'm good. Like, I'm fine. Um, I, but I don't expect you to be able to get that. But my goodness, they, they moved up. They got it. I'm happy that they were aggressive in going to get Terry and Arnold. I thought he was the much better fit of the two Alabama corners. And that, I don't mean that in any disrespect to, to Kool-Aid McKinstry at all, because I think there's just a good football player there too. But Terry on's his aggressiveness, his swagger, his mentality of like, if that ball's in the air, it's mine. That's what the lions want. And uh, you know, the ability to press, to disrupt off the line of scrimmage. Uh, that's something that, they just didn't do very well last year. Um, they tried at times, uh, but in fact, that they, they wanted playing more zone than they wanted to because the guys just couldn't get it done. And with Davis coming in, and now now with with Terry and Arnold on the outside, you've got some guys that can really disrupt it. And, and you know, your second round pick Rake Straw can do it too. Um, very physical, um, more physical than what you would expect out of their body type. And that's yeah. If you're looking at if you're looking at these two guys, the one thing that that does stand out. Not so much with Arnold, but more with Rick Straw is he, he's a little skinny, a little lanky, but he's not weak. And that that's something that stood out in his Missouri tape was that there's, you know, he doesn't know that he only weighs 185 pounds or whatever it is, being a little a little under six feet tall. Um, he's there's some there's some fight to these guys and uh, the mentality that they have. You know, Arnold is very outgoing, very um gregarious rake straw not so much they're, they're sort of a yin and a yang with them but uh style wise on the field they fit together very nicely yeah and that's another thing that's similar is like you're saying the size both being 511 both being in the 180s so uh very interesting that they uh one thing i did notice though and uh, correct me if i'm wrong but arnold uh seemed to be more um experienced and successful in press um yeah. Rockets were the opposite, that a little bit more zone guy. Um, but again, th- when you're talking about guys that that's why the word ascending talent is so important, that means that's usually a player that has also got the ability to be coached up. It doesn't have to be pigeonholed into one specific scheme. If you think he's good here, you probably think you can make him good there. And 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 that's what it, apparently uh, they were able to get, including guys that can play multiple spots because uh, – both of them can play outside. They've had experience inside. Matter of fact, Arnold, of course, was a converted safety. Exactly. And early on, it looks like, and, and keep in mind, Rick Straw has been injured. He's coming off of core muscle surgery, so he hasn't been fully cleared for participation yet. He's already getting looks on the inside. And that's okay. That that makes some sense with where the Lions' depth is because they also brought in Amik Robertson um, from, from the Raiders. Oh, yeah. He he's he's very small, but he's an outside only guy. He is absolutely not a slot player. The Raiders found that out the hard way. Um, just because he's five eight doesn't mean that he has to play inside. He actually is much better on the outside. Uh, so the reps have been going there, and then they did bring Kendall Vildor back. Um, he's you know he, he he took some lumps in the postseason. Um, the fans are a little down on him. I get it. I, I was too. Uh, but he's he's more, much more of an outside guy. So where the depth they needed was on the inside. Um, if Brian Branch, who is your slot and was spectacular at it as a rookie, if he needs to play more safety, they have somebody who can come in with some level of ability and a little bit of experience playing inside in Rake Straw and, and let him play inside. So he's sort of getting cross-trained a little bit uh, because, frankly, with if Arnold is who they think he is on the outside and who I think he is as well, with Carlton Davis and with Amik Robertson, 
he'd be number four on the outside. If you yeah. can get him on the field it, it, as your number two in the slot, or maybe, you know, if you want to let Branch freelance a little bit or play more safety as, as they need, because the depth at safety is kind of rough. Uh, yeah, that's that's not, that's not a bad thing at all in his case. No, and looking at the rlads.com uh, depth chart for the Lions, uh, it, it, this offseason is just – done the lions have done a very good job of uh just adding so much more talent and depth to that secondary which as uh, uh we've talked about this being a major issue for years so absolutely um they, they you know they've, they've done it smartly too in bringing in guys who can play what they want them to play you know um when they rolled the dice with jeff okuda back in the day different regime obviously different you know coaching staff and everything but I don't think they really had a plan for how to play him other than like, oh, he was good at Ohio State, he'll be good here. Like, yeah. Well, they didn't they didn't really process why he was good at Ohio State or what he did well at Ohio State and let him do that in the NFL as well. Um, I'm not sh- some of that's certainly on Jeff Okuda, like no question about that. But they did a really good job here of finding player fits, mentality fits, coaching style fits guys that are going to respond to what they need them to do. And, I, you know, Aaron Glenn, uh, the defensive coordinator and former NFL DB, a great one, um, he's really happy. That's, that's It's one of the first things that you notice um, around the facility is Aaron Glenn's got a little bit more uh, giddy up <laughs> in his gate right now. He's feeling pretty good about what he's got now. He hasn't had that for a while. <laughs> yeah, they now have a complete uh, roster depth chart-wise uh, – defensively and that is something that's going to be very interesting to see how uh it improves the overall team because uh yeah that, that was definitely the one thing that was lacking um and if these guys hit uh the lions are going to be in great shape okay uh let's stick with defense and talk about the uh, only other player that they drafted on defense because there's only six picks and that was uh, the kid from lsu wingo and a little undersized but um, I'm sure they've got a plan for him. And when you're that undersized for that position, you better be a highly athletic player. And that's exactly what Wingo will bring to the table besides, of course, his versatility and also uh, a team captain, which is something that is always kind of like uh, cherry on top. Oh, absolutely. You know, he wore number 18 at LSU. If you follow LSU football at all, you know what that means. That means that you're getting a dude. Um, a guy who's, who transcends what he does on the football field and does it also off the football field. And that's something that the Lions pay a, a freakish amount of attention to. Um, and I mean that in a good way. Um, they are getting guys that want to be that. They want that leadership. They want that camaraderie. They want that drive. And that, that's Wingo. He will play. So they, they run a, a base four-man front, but it does mix up sometimes. They move they move guys around. They have run with a five-man front before. And in a five-man front, he will be one of your, your two wings, so to speak. Um, there he's He can line up anywhere between the three and the, and the seven. And we'll probably see him be doing that. And that's an area where the, there's, there's room for him to make a, a, a splash right away because Levi Anzarike, with all of his injuries, with his neck fusion yeah. surgery, has never really panned out. He, now, he's still there, and he's got a shot. But there's room for that interior rush presence. Um, and it feels like they're making Josh Pascal play more outside this year. Okay. Um, I, I know when he came out of Kentucky, um, I believe he was in the 270 range. Um, he's got to be no more than 265 now. So yeah. he, it, it, I, I wouldn't expect to see a lot of him inside um, as much as he's played in his first couple of seasons. And he's been hurt a lot, too. So th- there's a path for Wingo to play a lot right away, even though he's a, a late round pick. And what about the kid from last year's draft? Uh, Martin. Roderick uh, Martin. Yeah. Yeah. A uh, healthy scratch almost his entire rookie season uh, coming out of Western Kentucky. This was a guy who a lot of us in the draft community sort of were like, okay. Like I, I, I remember watching him play, but I don't really like, I didn't study him all that much because I didn't think he was going to get drafted nearly that high. Um, he has lost quite a bit of the fat around like face, neck, shoulders, upper body. He, he, he talked about it. Uh, I, I got to stand next to him on uh, last Thursday after one of the OTA sessions. He's He weighs near the same as what he did, but he's reshaped it, and it looks a okay. lot better. And he talked about um, we have a new defensive line coach, and Terrell Williams came from the, the, the Titans where he worked with Tyre Tart, and uh, that's, that's sort of the model for him right now is to make him into Tyre Tart Part 2.0. Um, and if, if the Lions get that, they're in pretty good shape because that, 
That's a pretty good football player. Now he's got he's got some work to do. He's got to he's got to learn on, on keeping his pads down and getting a little bit more violent with his hands. He's already talked about that. That's what Terrell wants him to do. We'll see how well he can do it in the second season. He, he's certainly got the attitude for it. He's he's a sponge. He, he's trying very hard to make sure that it works. Um, and if if he's your backup nose tackle in, in year two and can get on the field for 10, 15, maybe 25 plays in a game if you have to, if DJ Reader needs a spell or Lee McNeil you know, into that rotation, the Lions are going to be that much better for it. And that, that seems to be the goal is to have him be that sort of third or fourth interior guy, um, play a lot against the run, maybe get in, um, it, you know, it, in the five-man packages if you want to go jumbo, goal line, things like that. Um, so not, not a full-time player, but a, a guy that has a, a definite role. Yeah, and maybe this is uh, going to be a habit now for the Lions with the draft because uh, we're going to get into their uh, third pick uh, that was uh, kind of from left field. And that's really what Martin was, as you as you pretty much yeah. alluded to. He was somebody that a lot of people thought, well, maybe he's, maybe he's just a free agent. And then yet the Lions liked him enough to take him in round three. So, hey, they, they like somebody. They're going to take him. They don't care about uh, uh, the noise uh, and no. – um, um, and so I see no reason to, well, one more before we do go to that kid. And that is because yeah. they, they, they signed uh, Pecco uh, from yes. Tennessee. Uh, does, does he have like a, 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 a serious role in the team or is he more like just veteran insurance? He is much more veteran insurance, I would okay. say. Um, remember, they brought in Tyson Alu Alu at the end of last season. Um, yes. He was sort of that guy. Uh, okay. Now he can play his way up. Um, there's mobility for him to, if he's good, if he's still, you know, got a lot to offer. He, he can push Anzarike off the team. Um, that's, that's sort of where his function point is, but ideally they would like it if he probably didn't make it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yes. But, uh, it's it's yes. one of those things, you know, and, and this is a, this is a problem that good teams have that the lions haven't really experienced before. We're used to, I was talking the other day with, with a friend, um, who's covered the Lions for a long time, go back, you know, five, ten years, like, your seventh-round picks, not only did they have to make the – they had to play, like, a lot. Like, yeah. we were counting on third, fourth-round, fifth-round guys. They had to start as rookies. Like, yeah. now we're happy if they make the team. It's it's a very strange – it it requires some some mental transition from us. Well, um, and, uh, and, and expectate – the difference in expectations for – you know, guys that are coming in that are, are projects, and we're about to talk about a big one. <laughs> yes. I, a matter of fact, what you have to do is take a look at, like, two players, like Rodriguez and uh, Vildor. And yeah. a couple of years ago, these guys would be starting. Uh, yeah. Rodrigo so, did start as a rookie. And yes. now he's he's number five on the depth chart. He's, yeah. and, and, and I will add, he's really good. Yes. Like, he yes. would start on other teams. Uh. But. The fact that he got thrust in, they kind of got a little bit lucky with the fact that he was so ready to go coming out of Oklahoma State. But, you know, now they don't need him to start, but they they have that kind of depth. Um, it, it's crazy to me that uh, on, on the last podcast uh, mailbag, somebody asked what the deepest position was. And I said linebacker. <laughs> and nobody in the history right. of the Detroit Lions would have ever said that <laughs> until this year. <laughs> crazy, uh, yeah. but crazy good. Okay. Yes. Uh, let's talk about this kid from Canada. So, uh, when you, what was the general reaction? What was your reaction when uh, you saw that uh, they had picked this player? So I had, I, I knew who he was. Like when they said Giovanni Manu, um, he goes by Gio. We'll call, we'll still keep calling him Giovanni though, because it's just easier for me to process it that way. Um, I knew that they had done a pre-draft visit with him. So, and I had written that up. So I'm like, okay, I'm familiar okay. with the the player. I knew that he was coming not from the BC Lions, but the University of British Columbia. Um, I had to learn what that school <laughs> was. Yeah. You know, but uh, uh, up until after, well, after they drafted him, I had only ever seen the highlight tape that was circling around there on, on YouTube that everybody else has seen. So it was like, my God, he looks really impressive athletically, but he's playing against Canadian True. Canadian college, and I'll, I'll equate it to um, I live in a an area where D3 football is very big here. I live right down the street from Hope College. Um, very good D3 program and a, and a good D3 conference. I would guess that more players in the conference that Hope College is in are more advanced football-wise than what he played against in Canada. Okay, So you're dealing with a very steep learning curve for 
Manu coming from where he's at. But if you and, and I will say this when we went through rookie mini camp, we all of us in the media were just like, okay, let's look at him. And look, I've used this line before, but it, it fits him so much. He looks like he came out of the womb lifting weights. Like, my God, for being six foot eight and 350 some pounds, there's no fat on this guy, like none. It's weird. And he moves so well. Like, you instantly see the appeal, but you're also like, okay, when you watch him play, like the first yeah. three reps that he had, um, guilty of really egregious holding penalties. So there's a lot of work to be done, but the athletic potential is there. And, you know, that's what you bet on um, when you've got an offensive line coach like Hank Fraley and the track record of development that they have. That's what you play to. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's interesting. My reaction was, this is probably three rounds too early for this, but <laughs> it came out later that like other teams, you know, it seems like the Eagles, the Chargers, they were they were seriously interested in maybe not quite that early, but you know, where the Lions picked him. Remember, they traded up to get into that. And then they also traded up to get that next pick as well, because they had traded out um of that third round pick to, to get Carlton Davis earlier. So they were sort of in a bind where like, okay, we have a willing buyer here. Um, to trade with, let's let's make the move and and well, let's shoot our shot. So, what do you think the plan is? Obviously, you've got a a, a, a potential lifer yeah. ahead of him on the depth chart. Um, yeah. Will, yeah. Will, will, will Sewell transition to left tackle when Decker's career is over, or will they just look for a left tackle somehow? What's the future like? So there. that's a good question, and it's been answered both ways by different people at different times. So okay. I don't think that they well, – I shouldn't say that. I think they know what they want to do, but I don't think they've communicated that to us clearly. Um, I think Panay knows what's going to happen. I think Taylor Decker knows – Like I, I think they have an organizational plan. We're unfortunately not privy to it. My okay. guess is he's the best right tackle in football. Don't fool with that. Yeah, sure. And that would kind of be my hope. Yeah, uh, understood. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing you know, that uh, uh, with several other teams. Some of the Chiefs are, are yeah. super, two time Super Bowl champs. That's a perfect example right there of what they're going through in camp this year. Taylor is more comfortable at right tackle. You stay there. We're going to make sure that uh, even though, you know, we, you know, the one spot on our offensive line is like the big mystery, that's, that's just the way it's going to be. Yeah. And, and Taylor Decker, by the way, is still doing really great at left tackle. So there's yes. no reason to, to yes. push there. They did yes. need depth, though. Um, their third tackle from last year, Matt Nelson, is with the Giants now. God help the Giants. Good luck with that. Um, Dan Skipper is back. Dan Skipper doesn't play tackle. He plays as the extra offensive lineman. He doesn't, like, if if Sewell or, or Decker were to go down, he wouldn't have been the fill-in tackle last year. So okay, he's back, but he's much more of a package player rather than a full-time substitute. And I don't know if Giovanni Manu is going to be that guy this year. If it oh, is, yes. he's going to have to he's going to have to grow up really fast. Oh, yeah. But uh you know, that that that's long term, I think they want to see where he can go and, and it sounds like they're going to try him some at guard. We haven't really seen a lot of it yet. We've only had two open practices. Uh, we do get mandatory mini camp this coming week, so hopefully we see him where where they're going to use him a little bit more, but uh yeah. He, he's a project. Um, it wouldn't surprise me at all if he doesn't play at all as a rookie. And much like Broderick Martin last year, I think Broderick got in the three games. I think he played, I want to say it was like something like 50 snaps. That that might be the, the case yeah. for, for your third round pick this year, too. Um, Makes or a fourth lot of round sense. pick. They traded the third round next year to get him. Okay. That's uh again, that's a good team problem. You can't do yeah. that if you're if you were three and thirteen. No. Or no. you know, coming no. out of last place and trying to grow. You'll be fired if something. you do that. If you're three and thirteen. Yes, yeah. you, yes, you will. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. what about the other two? Because and we'll go right to um, uh, yeah. Mahogany uh, because obviously okay. he's up front as well on the offensive line, and then there's also uh, the uh, free agent that they uh, picked up. Uh, uh, Where's that kid um, from Florida? Yeah, um, um Kuhn. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. So, uh, talk yeah. about uh, both of those guys, especially Mahogany, because a couple of years ago, before the injury, people were targeting. This is why trying to forecast who's going to be, you know, a first round pick in two years from now, 
or next year. Very, very hard to do. I know our lads just tries not to do it, even though we're like trying to put the new generation, we're trying to push them to do it. Not because we don't think that, you know, they're, they're, you know, we, we want to make them look bad because it's hard to right. do. Uh, right. And I yeah. think that's why they, they don't want to forecast something that's so far out, but people want to see it. They and do. Um, yeah, that's why I it's like. Attest, I can attest to that. Yeah, the, the, yes. the draft wire portion of my job is great evidence of that. Um, we can put out a 2026 mock draft right now <laughs> where I will have heard of maybe five of the players. Right. Yeah. Um, and it will get more reads than any in-depth analysis I do on anybody that got drafted this year. That's just, just the nature of the business. But uh, yes. I loved Christian Mahogany was my favorite pick. He was a top 50 talent for me. I would have been happy taking him in the second round. Uh, he is um, – He's a war daddy, man. He, he oh, He's yeah. going to come in. He is going to create a lot of movement in the run game. Doesn't matter who's across from him. He's moving them. That's what he does. He needs a little bit of help with his hands and, and balance and pass protection. But, man, there's so much to like about what he does. And he great fit culture-wise for this offensive oh, yeah. line. He's coming in and replacing Jonah Jackson. He's wearing the same number. And I swear to God, the first day of rookie minicamp when we walked in, we're like, What's Jonah doing here? And the, the, you know, it, it it's like they haven't lost anything. And I don't want to, you know, because Jonah Jackson was a Pro Bowler in 2022 and a deserving one. And I don't want to put that level of expectation on Christian Mahogany. But by the same token, there's no reason he can't be that guy. None. Yeah. Uh, I mean, great, what what, great, so what is it? His pick. inconsistency that is the biggest issue. Is that what? brings him down to the sixth round because I agree with you. I mean, so like I said, like I was saying, this kid was supposed to be a couple years ago before the injury, first round draft pick. That's what they were saying. Yeah. Then he gets injured and 2023, nah, not so good. Didn't really go as well as planned, but still, I That's mean, fair. yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, why uh, do you think he, he, why do you think he was graded so low? And, uh, and that's where he went. I, I will say um, he is smaller in person than you would think he is. Um, okay. And I'd say that, um, you know, he's he's still a big guy. Um, but the the reach and when you see him standing next, like standing between Panay Sewell and Frank Ragnar, who are both like, giant, taller guys for their positions, you, you kind of like, okay, all right, I see. Doesn't have the, the reach, doesn't have the um, – he's got a little bit of a sloppy body to him. Um Okay. Relative He's not to chiseled yet, huh? Yeah, yeah. Relative to to other players at that position that were in this okay. draft, relative, even the the undrafted guys they brought in, Egukun and also um, uh, Brian Hudson uh, out of Louisville, who's a guy who's, he's getting looks. Um, and the fact that he's played some center is getting him some looks as well. Because tell you what, that backup center role is wide open, and that's that's where an undrafted guy can make a, a dent. Uh, he, he's he's a little beefier than those guys, and maybe not as as instantly quick. Uh, but, uh, you know, athleticism is funny. I think he had a pretty good RAS grade score with his athleticism, but if you watch him play, maybe not as great in practice as it is on paper. doesn't mean he's a bad athlete, but I think that the, the loftiness of the expectations is probably not quite where his game is yet recovering from the knee injury that he had. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll find out right away. We'll, we'll see. We will. He's he he is your top interior reserve though, and uh, in Detroit that means you play a lot because of injuries happen every year. And that also includes the fact that you drafted a kid one round earlier last year. Yeah, Colby Sorstel. Yeah. So th does does that mean that he just is still you still aren't sure what you got there? Exactly. And, and I will harken back to last week at OTAs. He played in one practice session, every spot, but center, uh, they're okay. figuring out where he fits best. Um, he was a guard. He was a tackle at William and Mary. They tried to move him to guard last year. Now, because the tackle depth chart is the way such it is. I think they're my, my thought is, is that they're trying to make him the backup tackle, but also not like, don't, don't lose those guard training that you got because yeah. you might need that too. You know, but, okay. uh, the, he, he's a work in progress. He's another guy, um, like Broderick Martin, Coming from a smaller program, not not necessarily a football powerhouse or, or factory, where he's had to reshape his body a little bit. And you can kind of see that going on with Colby Sorstall, too. So uh, okay. uh, it's going to be interesting to see. Big summer for him on his future with the team. He can he can absolutely earn that that number three offensive tackle gig. 
Um, but if he doesn't develop the way that they need, it could be another year where he's bouncing between the practice squad and the active roster and, and stuff like that. Would you put, would you put then right now going into camp? Is he the number three tackle? I would say, yeah, um, he's yeah. ahead of Manu. And this is one of the curious things is we're, we're, as we're trying to do the roster gymnastics, how do you get to 53 when you have a rookie offensive tackle that you drafted that high that can't, you don't expect to be able to play right away. That's that's an interesting mix, how they're going to figure that out. Because then you also still have Dan Skipper. If he's going to make this team, he's the best number six offensive lineman in football. But can he can he carry all those guys with with such limited usage? Okay. Um, we're trying to figure that out. So yeah. we'll learn that one together. All right. Uh, now, when they drafted the last guy to talk about, Baki, when they drafted yeah. him, uh, did they and they always give a position to Detroit say running back? Yes. Okay. Um, and they've made it very clear. He is only playing running back. That's it. now okay. he's on the team for special teams. He's the number four running back. But he will be, he will never leave the field on special teams. And he's shown that already. He might be the return man. We don't know with, you know, how that's going to play out. There's a lot of guys that can do that on this roster. Um, and, and that's going to be a, a camp competition this summer. Okay. But uh, he's going to be in that mix, and he will be on the coverage units. And and he's if he's not the return man, he's going to play a lot on as a blocking, you know, with the, the new, especially the kickoffs. Uh, that's oh, yeah. that's where he's going to. That's where he's really going to earn his uh, his NFL. Uh, I hate to compare him to a guy like Matthew Slater because who's who's got a chance to go to the Hall of Fame despite never playing on offense. Oh yeah. Um, but Vaki could have that level of impact on the Lions special teams with the way that they've changed things. And, you know, they let they let a couple of guys who were only on the roster for special teams go this offseason, guys like Chase Lucas and Anthony Pittman. Um, he can fill their roles very immediately. Um, and so far, he's already shown that, like, it's just – it's it's natural. Do you think he is going to remain the number four running back when camp is done? Um <clears throat> Craig Reynolds, they still because that's a nice little battle there. It for, is because we know Vacu make the team, but you have the, yes. you know Reynolds, you know, nice little veteran, and he, you know he's, when you see him, he makes plays here and there. But then you got the other young kids, including they still have Jefferson. Um, they do, and Knight showed up and uh, before he got hurt. So is, is that going to be a battle between those three or four kids on the depth chart right now for that final spot? Absolutely, and and also how many do they keep? Because we just talked about the logs in that they have a, an offensive line. Do they have to keep an extra one there? Does, do they, does that subtract somebody from their running back room? Does it cut somebody from the, the corner back room? You know, that that's that remains to be seen. But that's going to be one of the things that we're watching this summer is, you know, uh, Vaki could could absolutely beat out Craig Reynolds for that job um, if, if he shows enough as a running back. And, uh, you know, again, nothing against Craig Reynolds. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big Craig Reynolds fan. You know, I, I have been beating his drum for a long time, but if Vaki is better than him, they're not going to keep him just to keep him. That's why it's so great to get guys like Vaki because he can fill yes. several roles on your roster and your depth chart. And that's exactly why you pick guys like that in the middle to later rounds. It just helps you save money. So, yep. okay. Um, let's continue then with the free agents. We talked about, um, uh, egg Yukon from Florida. So yeah. he looks like he's a guy that, yeah, you think he's going to make the team. It just makes they sense. They paid him a lot. They so, played him yeah. a lot. Yes. So <laughs> that would make sense. Um, yeah. It, yeah. And, uh, you know, all, all the centers that are there, um, they're fighting for one job and there is a spot that the backup center, Michael Neese, who came over from the Buccaneers, uh, I think he was with the Jets for a, a cup of coffee as well. Um, has been the backup center, but that's that's a role that's there for the taking, and they would love it if one of the UDFAs sees that. So okay. that, that's that's certainly a spot where, of all the undrafted free agents, that's the most likely landing spot for anybody on the active roster is that backup center role. And as far as some more of these uh, signings, two of them, the wide receivers, uh, Calhoun and, and uh, Juice Williams. Now, if you're yeah. a big college fan, you know Juice started off as like a hot shot, pretty high recruit for Illinois, a quarterback, didn't work out there. And then all of a sudden you saw him show up at wide receiver and good for him. He made the transition 
and did a really nice job there for Illinois. Yeah. And that was a nice little story. And Calhoun had a, had a pretty good uh, last couple of years for Duke. So, um, but Williams, yeah. uh, did, did he, you give him a shot to make the team. Yes, I do. Uh, and he could very well be your punt and kick return man as well. Um, as well as the backup slot receiver behind Amon Ross St. Brown. Not that that gets you on the field very much because Amon Ross is an all pro, but uh you know, he he has looked the part. Um, that's another guy that they paid over $200,000 to. He's actually earning more than seventh round picks. Show some level of commitment. Um, I, I would lean more towards him being on the team than not. And and Calhoun, good football player. Um, my heads look good from what we've seen thus far in camp, too. Um, they find receivers that way. They had uh, uh, Drummond last year from Eastern Michigan who wound up being on the Giants roster after he didn't make it in Detroit. They... They have an eye for those kind of guys, so uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he if he doesn't make it in Detroit if he winds up somewhere else. Uh, he's he's shown that much already. All right, and then uh, on defense, uh, talk about would Steel Chambers would he be the top candidate to make it? Yeah, from, he would. Okay, he pro- probably. Um, Ugu has a shot though. Uh, okay, they are not. They're not necessarily wedded to their depth on the outside. They got rid of both the Quora brothers this past offseason. Charles Harris is gone. So there's room for somebody to, if, if they can make a splash, you know, um, with, with Pascal and, and James Houston is coming off of an injury and coming back. And, you know, expectations are very hopeful for James Houston. But if, it, if it's not there, um, they, they, they've got a couple guys in there now that, that can challenge that. Um, I, I personally, I expect James Houston to be fine. Um, I, I don't expect him to get eight sacks in six games again, like he did at the no, end of his rookie come season. On now. But so uh, he he he's he's certainly a fun player to watch. And uh, watching him get back, um, he's still injured right now. He was working off on the side with trainers last week. Hopefully, he's cleared soon okay. uh, because he does need the experience. He needs some reps. But uh, there there's a chance if if you can make a splash, you can you can make the team there. Yeah, Chambers is actually the guy that. Out of all of the uh, free agents that had the highest grade, um, yeah. our lads uh, pegged them as a potential fourth round draft pick. So to be able to pick them up after the draft uh, was nice. And um, look, you, you have a lot of experience there at Ohio State, and yeah, and that's did. gonna yeah, and that's gonna get you um, a lot of opportunities. Now, look, as a Michigan fan um, and and just college football fan, you know, he never really took the next step of being somebody that was going to be say special or early round pick or anything like that, but still uh, not even drafted. Uh, You would think it was was surprising. It was surprising to me that he went undrafted as well. Um, And he is going to, he's going to be one of those guys. Uh, Trevor Nowoski from Saginaw Valley state made this team last year as an undrafted rookie because he was indispensable on special teams. That's recurring theme here. That's oh, where Steel Chambers is going to make it or not. Yep. And uh, you mentioned Aku. So yeah. why do you think he has? And I know you you mentioned the other guys, but for him specifically, what have you noticed he, that gives you that, he, that that thinking? The the thing that I liked about him is that he can go speed to power, but he can also go power to speed. He's not necessarily a one note type of pass rusher, and I think that that sort of diversity will get him where okay, I can back up James Houston, who's very much a speed to power guy. Or I can back up Josh Pascal is more of a power to speed guy. You know, they okay. can sort of fit him in, in in the depth chart in a number of different spots rather than just in a singular role. And would that be it? Would you would you would you say Agucon, Williams, Calhoun, Chambers, and Aku? Those would be yeah, your, probably. your likely candidates. Um, yeah. Um Nate Lynn has looked good every time I've seen him, so I don't want to I don't want to rule him out either. But uh he's got an uphill battle at the depth chart where he's trying to get in at. Okay. Now, uh, and 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 uh, just also want to uh, everything is is there's nothing else to do on special teams. The main thing is is to find uh, returners. But are they yeah. set at place kicker? Probably. Okay. <laughs> Lions fans will dispute that. I think Michael Badge is going to be fine. I think he. I, now he will get challenged. Um, and whether it's it's uh, James Turner, the undrafted rookie from Michigan, or if they go after Jake Bates from the Michigan Panthers of the UFL, who has had a phenomenal amount of success kicking in Ford Field, wouldn't surprise people. But uh, Badgley's he's earned the trust of the coaching staff, 
And uh, I know Lions fans are like, well, then why didn't they use him? Um, that's that's a coaching decision. That's not that's not <laughs> yeah. not related to who he is. That's yeah. related to Dan Campbell's attitude and and towards kicking uh, more than anything. <laughs> um, and that's uh, you know that's the cost of doing business with Dan Campbell as your coach. You got to you got to deal with the fact that he's going to be hyper aggressive and, and chasing points. That's um, it. Yeah. Six right. is more than three, as he's pointed out a couple times. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I will I say, Look, go ahead. Long snapper. Oh, okay. H Hogan Hatton can win that job. Oh, <laughs> there you go. There's another one. Yeah. And why is that? Is that because of a combination of him and and uh, Daly, or uh, one or the other? Yeah, Daly's coming off of an injury. I will say, uh, in the practice that we saw last week. Hatton was better. Now it's one practice. It's in the spring. They're not in pads. Yeah, but I, I, I don't think they're wedded to Scott Daly if if Hatton is just as good and they can save a, you know five hundred thousand dollars here or there. That, that, that's not insignificant. That was not okay. Let's wrap up, and I want to talk about the schedule. Yeah. So. What was first? Yeah, what was your first impression? Let's move this into here. What was your first impression uh, of the schedule when you looked at it? What, what stuck out? What, what's the what's the headline? What's the stories? So they got a lot of primetime games, and that's something that we're not used to in Detroit. And that's something that we're going to have to get used to. You look week one, sure. the Rams right away. Matthew Stafford coming back to Detroit, um, and after we won our first playoff game in thirty. 33 years yeah. um, over them. Um, that's going to be, that's going to be fun. Uh, you know, Tampa Bay, good football team. We beat them in the postseason last year too. So you got two postseason rematches right off the bat. You got a lot of home games cluster. And then you get that giant, there's a, cl a cluster in the middle where they're on the road a lot, especially right after their early buy. And, you know, coming out, you got at Dallas, at Minnesota, a scroll in there. You know, you got Tennessee, then you got you know, your, your AFC South battles. Um, I, I believe it's six road games in eight weeks, Ooh. if I'm not mistaken. And some, you know, again, at Dallas, at Houston, that's a, that's a really good football team in Houston. At Green Bay, that's probably going to be a really good football team in Green Bay. Like, there, that's, that's, that's going to be tough. Um, especially with the early buy, you don't get that that break yeah. on it so much. You know, I I would have liked the buy to be week eight, week nine would have been better yeah. for me, but it is what it is. Um, and then at the end, you get Monday night, the last Monday night football game, week seventeen in San Francisco. There's a chance that could be for the number one seed. There's a chance that could be for a division title for either team or both teams. I don't like being Monday night football that late in the year because the next week, every game's a noon game or, or, or every game's a, su a Sunday game. So you're going to lose some advantage there going into your last game against Minnesota. Maybe that game won't mean anything. Hopefully it doesn't for the Lions. Hopefully they've got the, the division title wrapped up, but you know, the Vikings are playing, you know, 38 hours earlier the week before. That's, I don't like oh. that. I just don't, I just don't. <laughs> That's a big edge. So where's the home? Okay, if if they get six out of eight on the road, where's the home edge? Early in the season, early, and then um, right after that series, um, you get you get the the Thanksgiving game. Um, you get Green Bay coming in. You get you know, your your divisional home games out of the way later in the year, which is okay. nice. You know, you kind of want that. There are only three outdoor games. If you know Jared Goff's career splits between inside and outside, you'll know that's a very good thing for Detroit that he's playing more indoors. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's uh, I, you know, I expect this team to be very good. Yes, um, and I, I expect them to be up for the challenge. But it's it's not a cake schedule. Um, it, wow. It's the first time we've ever had a first place schedule in that's, Detroit. That's the that's way it works. Yeah. Yep. Well, look, Bring I it. think this is, uh, yeah, just taking a look at here. I mean, uh, you, you have that, uh, like you mentioned with the Thanksgiving day. So you've got the Thanksgiving home Thursday again with the Packers yeah. Yeah. At, at home and then yeah. Buffalo and, at home. Yeah. So yeah, th those are, and who knows Chicago, even though I think they're being a little overrated right now in my book. Uh, I agree. They, they should be. You know, They've gotten better. Yes, no doubt the coaching about it. staff did a really nice job at the end of the season. We all noticed that. 
Um, but it's still a rookie quarterback, and I don't think I don't think they're Houston. I just don't. I agree. Uh, especially I because so. Houston, Houston didn't have to deal with Detroit and Green Bay in the division yes. last year. Yes. Yeah, so. still don't this year either. Probably <laughs> no. <laughs> so yeah, and um, uh, Buffalo, and, and I, I've said this before. I think there are two teams on their schedule that didn't get better from last year. Dallas is one, and Buffalo is the other. Yeah, you're um, right. And that that doesn't mean that those teams are bad. No. Um, they're still very formidable, but I'm not sure that they got any better. So those are those are games that if you looked at that schedule on paper, you're probably like, oh, maybe uh, that doesn't look so good. But those games don't look as difficult when you look through the prism of what those teams have gone through this past offseason with you know Stephon Diggs now being sure. in Houston, um, with Dallas not really doing anything, <laughs> just as Cowboys fans lament all the time. <laughs> Um, so, wow. you know, hey. it, it, it's dangerous when you play the schedule game early because you never oh, know yeah. what teams are going to be. You don't know who the surprise yeah. Like, for all I know, like, I don't think the Indianapolis Colts are going to be all that great this year. They could wind up going 14 and three. Like, they, they do have that. that ability with Anthony yeah. Richardson coming back. So you, you just, you got to be real careful about that. But I, I, I think this is a double digit win team for sure and should repeat as the NFC North champs. And very important to get off to that good start because that's the other part, uh, the home part is being able to come out with three out of four at home. And yeah. even though the buy is early, the fact is, basically, you've got one road game. You're leaving Detroit right. once before the second week of October. So yeah. it, it may not be what you want, but you've got to take advantage of it. That's good. Yeah, you got to make some hay there. And this team has yeah. struggled for a long time against Seattle. Uh, that that's a, that's a big win. This The Lions have never beaten the Tennessee Titans ever oh, okay that 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 needs to change this year too the board. yes <laughs> uh all right um uh, the last thing i want to ask you uh is do you think that the lions are done as far as adding any uh, notable free agents and is there and or is there a position left on the depth chart that you think i'm a little bit concerned with and then maybe that's the the the, the, the spot that they may look at especially if there is an injury I would still love to see them add a veteran safety to the group, okay. uh, uh, but I'm not sure that they share that sentiment. It, it it wouldn't surprise me if they just went with what they had, um, unless there's an injury and they're forced to bring in a guy like Quandre Diggs, former Lion, um, would be great. Justin Simmons would be outstanding. I don't think he's going to – I don't think that they're going to pay what he's looking for to get him in here. I think other teams are going to have a higher – degree of demand for him but there is certainly a spot for a veteran safety on this team who can come in and sort of play he can play the single high role he can play a split role he can play a box role if you got somebody like that a versatile veteran who can you know buy you depth and also mentor like this is still a very young football team the starters you know you got kirby joseph and if you have some on who they're they're both young yep um malifa who took a big jump at the end of last season when they decided to only play him in the box and we're hopeful that that carries over because that he was a real asset and he hadn't been to that point. So hopefully that that persists and carries forward because uh, that wound up being a really good mix because Kirby Joseph is a coverage only safety. He's not a guy that you want in the box. So um, if, you can if use they can somebody find back there with that, a little of uh, flexibility that can do. Both. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and you know, Brandon Joseph, an undrafted rookie last year, who's still around. I expect him to make the team, but he's another guy you, you really don't want him tackling. You just don't. You want them covering. So if they could get a more all-around type of guy, maybe, maybe C.J. Moore coming back after his year off the suspension from the gambling is that guy. We'll see. But uh, I would be happy if they brought someone in. I'm not sure that they share that urgency. Okay. Well, that is the one spot that just happens to have the most name free agents available is safety, yeah. defensive back. Those are the, especially safety. And uh, yeah, yeah they're going to be guys available. And, and and look, if 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 one injury does occur, then maybe that's the trigger point of, all right, well, we got to get someone. But because like you're saying, I mean, you're talking about, well, w but what does happen if there's an injury? You you, you, you know, you, you know, now maybe it's because there's enough of guys to choose from. And like you said, some of these guys are looking maybe for more money than, and and it's a one of those struggles you go back and forth with the agents and that's eh, June. Let's yeah. just wait for somebody to get hurt, and then Thanks. price goes up. I'll get what I want. No rush right now. So yeah, 
we'll see how that works out. But anyway, the Lions uh, are looking real good. We're going to talk, of course, uh, one more time at the very least before the season begins and get your take on how camp went um, or and uh, uh, the summer and so forth. So in the meantime, for everybody that's uh, an RLAD subscriber already, and as well you should be, uh, again, behind me, you see that's the Detroit Lions podcast going on right now with Jeff. He does a live show once a week. He does about three total a week on the channel. Um, matter of fact, on my YouTube channel, Prime Sports Network, um, you have those uh, sites on the bottom of your uh, channel of, of where you think uh, fans should go. And uh, we have the Detroit Lions up there as one of them. So that's how much we respect the channel and the work you do, Jeff. And always uh, great having you here on the show. And you helped me out to uh, get ready to uh, put my, uh, oh, my draft review guys over there, but to uh, <laughs> uh, get ready for the 2024 draft review guide that's coming out in a couple of weeks. Actually, yeah, I got to get the deadlines like two days. So we got you in just on time. All right, so good. I like, put the Detroit Lions notes that I went over here on our interview to good use. So I appreciate that as always, Jeff. And I look forward to uh, talking to you in a few months. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me and appreciate it. You got it, Jeff. All right. Thank you. And again, don't forget, subscribe, like, and share if you haven't already. And we'll see everybody uh, again. Uh, if you're just coming back for your Detroit Lions uh, fix, then uh, we'll see you back when Jeff's here. Otherwise, we'll see everybody else real soon.